So good afternoon everyone. So my name is Ross Ducher and I'm Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of the West of Scotland. Uh, and I'm here uh, with um, my good friend and colleague uh, James Densley. So James will introduce himself just in a minute but we're going to talk about um, our newly published paper Deficit or Credit, uh, a Comparative Qualitative Study of Gender Agency and Female Gang Membership in Los Angeles and Glasgow. So I'll pass over to, to James first to introduce himself. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is James Densley. I'm a professor of criminal justice at Metropolitan State University, uh, which is actually based in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota in America. Uh, but I'm originally from the UK, grew up in Leicester. Um, and uh, yeah, just delighted to be here uh, talking with you, Ross, about this paper. Uh, just was published in the journal Crime and Delinquency. Um, and it was a collaboration between the two of us, but also two other colleagues, uh, Robert McLean, uh, who's also based up with you, Ross, uh, in uh, west of Scotland, and then Simon Harding, who's in the west of London. Um, and so the four of us put, uh, put this work together and uh, yeah, great to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh... Yeah, so the paper was, um, it was a real, uh, really exciting opportunity for me personally because I've been working maybe for about 12, 13 years in, in gang research, uh, but the huge majority of the work I've done has been with male gang members. Uh, and so this was something really quite different for me to actually work with female gang members and to put a paper together um, on their insights. And I think, you know, one of the things that struck me when I started this work was uh, the real kind of, the relative paucity of research on female gang uh, members in recent years. Uh, and another thing I was conscious of was uh, that there isn't that much in the way of comparative research uh, between really diverse contexts like this one, you know, Glasgow in Scotland and Los Angeles in the United States in the subject area. What do you think, James? Yeah, it was interesting because I agree. I've done a little bit of research in the past on female gang members, but I think part of it as well is we were very conscious as male researchers, like what our role was in being able to sort of advance those voices and whether or not we were the best custodians of that information. But we had the data through Robert's interviews in Scotland and then your interviews in Los Angeles. And we just sort of came to that point where we're saying, but this is, this is a topic that no one's writing about. They need to be writing about it. The voices need to come out. We need to hear it. And so we felt like there was a sort of obligation to, to share that data and use it. And, and I'm glad that we did, I really am. Um, and I think the comparative aspect, for me, really elevates the work. You know, uh, Matt Klein with the Eurogang group always used to say that the best sort of gang research would be based on comparisons because you want to be able to see what's going on in different locations, whether or not trends are the same or whether or not they're different. And, What's kind of cool about this is Los Angeles is always held up as the sort of gang capital of the world, if you will. Whether that's fair or not is another question, but it certainly has that history about it. And in Europe, I think Glasgow has a similar type of reputation. You know, Glasgow has often been held up as this sort of violent capital with a history going back, you know, 100, 150 years of gangs. And so being able to kind of compare and contrast between those two cities might on its face seem odd, but in many ways, I think it made a perfect sense. And it ended up with a pretty fruitful uh, sort of collaboration, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and it was, it was really interesting how it came together because um, originally it, it wasn't planned as a comparative study, I suppose. Um, it kind of... It was it, it kind of emerged that way eventually. You know, I happened to be collecting data in Los Angeles for a wider study uh, that I was in, in, involved in, where I was collecting data in homeboy industries um, in um, in the city, which is one of the largest gang intervention programs and most renowned uh, rehabilitation programs for gang members in the world, and. Um, I had a mixed sample uh, there, and um, uh, but 
this, the main study I was focusing on was looking at masculinity and um, the role of masculinity in gang membership and gang desistance. But I also had this group of female gang members I was working with. And so I, 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 re I always wanted to do something with that data and to produce something from it. And it so happened that Robert uh, also had been working with female gang members as part of his wider sample for his study on gangs and organised crime in Glasgow. Uh, and so it seemed quite interesting and natural to us both to bring those data sets together. Um, so it was really, it was quite interesting the way it happened. And it, as you said, James, two very um, uh, different settings in lots of ways because Los Angeles, for instance, in terms of uh, the ethnic uh, backdrop, you know, 90% roughly of the population are either Latino or African American, whereas less than 10% of those living in the deprived communities in Glasgow where Robert were working are non white. So it made for a really interesting contrast and also the very different gang comp um, context. You know, much more predominantly dominated by firearms and drug distribution networks in Los Angeles, whereas traditionally in Glasgow it's more been about territorial um, rivalries and also knife crime. I think interestingly it was the drug economy that was part of the bridge between those two contexts because like you said we had knife crime versus gun crime and we had sort of the urban sprawl of Los Angeles versus the kind of uh, territoriality of Glasgow and these were sort of different contexts but the great equalizer ended up becoming the drug economy because this was a way of, of, of a lens if you will of getting to what were the experiences of the young women in terms of why they were getting involved in gang life? And it was often those economic circumstances which were sort of driving that conversation. And so I, I think that's where we, we really have a great insight in this paper because we can start to then get to, and it's the title of the paper, that some young women are entering into this gang life you know, in credit, if you will, that they are bringing certain skills, assets, networks, social capital, if you will, to the gang. Whereas others were more tied with debt bondage, that they actually were entering the gang in, in a sort of a deficit framework. Um, and that they were trying to get out of abusive relationships, were trying to sort of change their lives in a certain way, and the gang is becoming the avenue for that. And so it was interesting that the sort of the drug economy started to become our lens and that was sort of then how we saw the kind of framework for analyzing the data and, and and advancing it in that way yeah i agree that was a really unique um contribution i think of this paper no credit to to robert and simon harding as well our co-authors for, for yeah i think it was simon that uh, i remember the sort of the the email back and forth on on that and it was it was this sort of aha moment of when we were analyzing the data and and sort of thinking about how best to frame the paper that that sort of really really came out and uh, yeah. And it was from that moment on where I think we realised, oh, we were onto something here. I think so, because, you know, I think quite often in the past with other female gang studies, the, the women have often been portrayed in quite stereotypical ways, you know, either as maladjusted tomboys or as sex objects. I mean, Messerschmitt has talked about um, bad girl femininity, for example, uh, in his work and the way in which um, sometimes um, girls' participation in gangs offers an avenue for challenging uh, normative gender roles and, uh, and also Leland and Hunt have talked about emphasised femininity. Uh, but I think what we brought was just a, 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 a new insight into those kinds of credit and deficit entry points into the gang for women that maybe hadn't been explored before. The contribution is really around agency, which usually gets lost in the conversations about female gang members. And, and even when I think about the broader conversation that's going on right now, particularly in the United Kingdom around county lines, where often the portrayal of young women is that they are exploited, that they are victimized. And of course that is true. And no one would be entering into that lifestyle if they had all the opportunities 
and, and, and everything that was, that was needed to be afforded to them. But what we were also finding is that some people were entering into gangs kind of more of their own volition and that there was a degree of agency and they had some control and in many ways were sort of carving out a life for themselves in this you know, dangerous uh, male-dominated economy. Um, and I think that is a unique way of thinking about it because then you sort of take a step back and you think, it's not just that people are being sort of coerced into this lifestyle, it's that people are actually choosing to go into it and they're making the choice because of the lack of opportunities, the poverty and the, op and the illegal opportunities that are presented to them. And I think in turn that, that then has broader policy and practice implications because if you don't fix those problems, you're never going to to sort of change the narrative and help people turn their lives around. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, it was what I found really interesting was for, although it was very different contexts, um, and as I said, you know, all of the, the women in Los Angeles were either of Mexican descent, or one was African American, one was mixed race. In Scotland, they were all white. Um, very different kind of gang context and yet in some ways some of their experiences were so similar you know in terms of the girls that entered through the deficit route it was often about things like adverse childhood experiences that they'd had trauma that they'd suffered sometimes they were jumped in or and it, even I think in one case they had been sexed in um, and in, in some cases maybe because they were attracted to the kind of bad boy members of the gangs for instance so there were quite a lot of commonalities on the one hand but also quite a lot of differences yeah it, that's i think that's true the, the, it seemed to be the, the sort of the hook was often some sort of connection to a male gang member or someone who was embedded in a criminal network and i think that's quite common in the research to see that type of connection but um but it does speak to this idea of sort of like if only you could get on that early intervention before, like you mentioned, the adverse childhood experiences and the other factors which are motivating young women to enter into gangs, if only you could get there early, then some of this would have been prevented on the front end. And I think, again, that has, that has good implications for how we think about uh, helping young women out of gangs and making sure they never join them in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the other aspect was, particularly in Glasgow, I think what we found was that some of the women were had a lot more agency, you know, than some people might expect, and actually entered through a real kind of credit um, uh, uh, role, you know, through, for instance, kinship ties. It was we found came through in quite a few occasions, you know, that maybe they had a father or an uncle or someone in their family that were already deeply embedded within organised criminality, drug distribution networks, and it seemed to be that the women, when they came through uh, that route, seemed to have a lot more acceptance, a lot more agency, and could actually move into leadership roles quite quickly. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, the power of the social network. You know, it, it's a, a classic example as well. It's, it's not always what you know, it's who you know. Or, as sometimes you like to say, it's, it's what you know about who you know that matters. Um, but I think this is, you see it in, in, in the narratives in this uh, particular paper where young women, if they had a family member or someone they had a close relationship to who was embedded within a criminal network, and they had access, that accelerated their opportunities for advancement within this sort of uh, underworld environment. And in some cases, young women were exploited through those networks, but in others, they leveraged them in order to really advance through the system and to become quite successful entrepreneurs in the illegal marketplace. And some of these young women were were operating, you know, pretty sophisticated uh, operations by the by the end of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it really fascinating. For instance, the, the young um, woman Karen uh, that had been part of Robert Sample. You know, just to quote from her, she said to us at one point, "You know, people think being a woman makes me weak. It actually probably gives me a better position than most." 
think about it, even though everyone knows I sell, they just can't see it. It's in their face, but they'll say, she's a woman. Obviously, there must be a guy behind the scenes. Got to be. You get me. But it isn't like that, she said. I don't hide it. I, I want my clientele to know if they want anything, then they come to me. There isn't anyone else. And so, you know, she seemed to have a real kind of entrepreneurial leadership um, attitude. And she certainly didn't feel that she was at the mercy of any of the men, you know, in the, in the networks. No, not at all. And, and actually, to the point where she was using that to her advantage as well. It, in fact, almost flipping it around that it became a weakness of the people that she was working with because they had gone into these interactions with their own kind of sexist assumptions about the role of women in this world. And there's no way a woman could be at the top of the hierarchy. There's no way a woman would have the, the right connections to be able to do the things that she can do. And that she used to her advantage. So she sort of, you know, the, even the criminal world is sexist. And she was finding ways to use that to her advantage, which I think was just really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because she went on to say as well, which I found really interesting, you know, that um, she says most of the guys I work with are full of bravado um, and I don't have a problem. Uh, being a woman probably helps me stay focused and not get sidetracked into that kind of guy, big balls bullshit of who is the toughest, you know, and it was really interesting, I thought, uh, how she and some of the other women were really able to stay focused on the business elements without getting sidetracked into the violence and the competitiveness and the bravado. Yeah, it's, I think it also speaks to this idea, like, whenever you watch the movies about gangs and gangsters and stuff, it's always the tough guys or whatever that, that get a lot of the play and a lot of the traction. But actually, you need to be pretty smart to be able to run a sophisticated drug dealing operation. And I think quotes like that really highlight this aspect. It's not just about your physical prowess. It's actually about your kind of entrepreneurism and your street smarts that are the most important thing for being successful in that, in that, uh, in that marketplace. Yeah, yeah. And I also found it quite interesting, though, that in Los Angeles, some of the women, you know, we talk about bad girl femininity, some of the women did actively participate in the street violence, you know, and, um, you know, the even in some occasions, you know, would involve their, take their kids out with them, you know, once they'd become mothers. Is that something yeah. you found in, in, in wider uh, research you've been involved in in America, James? You know, it's true. In the United States, the literature seems to suggest that there is this element of young women sort of playing up to the male role. And that might include having to sort of become more violent and, and more street orientated in the activities. But when, when we sort of learned this idea of like bringing children out into the fray, I felt like it was, that was a really... So it's something I wasn't expecting to hear. And it sort of, and I think it played with a lot of maybe assumptions that I had that maybe children wouldn't be, um, you know, affected by this, by this world. And what it actually means to be a, a parent in these environments where the gangs operate. It made me sort of take pause for a minute. I kind of took a step back and was like, wow. Like, I mean, I'm a parent. And when you think about, the things you do to sort of protect your children or provide them with opportunities and the steps you take. And then to think about, well, if I was in an environment where gangs were active and that I was part of that lifestyle, what would that mean to be a parent in those environments? What choices are you having to make? We actually found that there was slight differences in perceptions among the women in Los Angeles in particular. You know, one of the women or a couple of them very much took their kids out in the street. But there was one of the participants that was, you know, very definite in the fact that that was her turning point. When she became a mother, she would never have wanted her kids involved. And when she started to see her kids starting to take on some of those attitudes, that was the point she knew that she had to stop. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, no, I think that's what I was saying earlier is, you know, I, I think about it from the perspective of being a parent. And... And the, 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 the navigation that those young women were doing 
where you had some young women who were using their children to as, as, as like part of the gang and as part of the lifestyle. And then you had other women who we interviewed who said it was actually motherhood, which was their cue to leave the gang. That was the moment where they realized it was time to get out because it was unsafe and it was not the, shall we say, it was not the image that they wanted to portray as they became mothers. So it was an interesting dynamic where you, you, I thought it would be a cut and dry case of, you know, motherhood would be the key to desistance from, and disengagement for the gang. But actually, yeah. in some cases, it wasn't. And I think that speaks to the idea that for some young women, the more embedded you are within the gang and some of the other things that's going on with your life, not even motherhood uh, is enough to get you out of the lifestyle. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was interesting because some of the previous research has has suggested that motherhood can become a real trigger and a turning point for desistance for for women. And certainly we did find that in in, in some cases, but for others it, it wasn't, which was interesting. I was going to ask you, because I know James and you know your previous one of your previous papers with David Parouz, you've talked about um, the signalling perspective within gangs and the kind of gender signalling issue. How, how do you think, you know, that um, related to what we found here? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think there's a lot... I, I think about gang membership often as sort of almost like a dance. And you've got somebody who initiates the dance and then you have somebody who kind of receives it and then it goes back and forth in that dynamic. And I think there was elements of this paper where you saw that there was something unique about being a woman that changed the dynamic of how you interacted with the group, but also how the group interacted with you. And when I think about it from a signaling sort of standpoint is there are certain things like take motherhood as a great example. You know, motherhood, I think, is something that is a much more credible signal for a woman as a means of exiting a gang than perhaps fatherhood is for a man trying to exit the gang because of the way in which motherhood is constructed in our society. It's a more powerful signal for a woman than it is for a parenthood is a more powerful signal for a woman than it is for a man as an example. So there's some dynamics there, which I think are important when you think about signaling. And then when you're in the gang, the things that you have to do as a woman to demonstrate your commitment to the group are qualitatively different compared to being a man. And so I think the signals that are being shared are different in those different uh, contexts as well. So I think it's really an important lens to see uh, the, the different ways uh, men and women interact in those groups. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. I suppose the other thing maybe we should uh, just highlight is that although we're, we're saying that some of these women had great agency, there was sadly a lot of illustrations of exploitation uh, as well, um, you know, where some of the women, and I suppose this is where the connection with um, things like county lines and, and even cuckooing uh, comes in, you know, some of the women clearly had to store drugs for other people to pay off their own debts, for instance, that some of their male partners had got them into, and even in some cases being forced into prostitution. Um, so, you know, that was, a, that was an important element I think we needed to bring out, James. Yeah, and again, even for those women who had agency, you always take a step back and you ask yourself, you know, why were they in this type of lifestyle in the first place, even though they've carved out a life for themselves and they are quote unquote successful as drug dealers or as gang members, you just wish it didn't have to be that way. And, and I think the flip side is, is then for those young women who are you know, overtly being exploited and who are definitely uh, you know, in, in, in sort of dire straits when they're in these gangs, you then sort of wonder, what is it that we need to do to just change the narrative so that this doesn't become a reality for other young women? Because sadly, too many young women are getting sucked into this life and are trapped within it. And they're being exploited and they're being victimized. And uh, th th we need to do something about that.
Yeah, definitely. What, what do you think um, uh, are the implications for practice, James, from this paper? I mean, we've, we've written a little bit about that at the end, but yeah, had any more thoughts about how this might um, impact potentially on practice or future research as well? Well, I do, I do think it speaks to the idea that so often when we talk about gangs, we only see and talk about men and young boys. And, and I do think it, it speaks to, we need to start bringing women into that framework and into that conversation and not overlooking them and ignoring them. And then recognizing that young women may have unique needs and, and different trajectories in and out of gangs which means that there can't necessarily be a one-size-fits-all model for gang intervention or gang prevention, that we have to be thinking about the gender differences and the lived experience of gang membership for young women and for, and for girls, because that in turn is going to change the framework. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And I, I guess, you know, maybe we could see it as a limitation in as much as here's a paper about female gang members, but it's a team of four male criminologists, you know, uh, that put it together and wrote it. Maybe that was a, a little bit of a limitation in our, in our authorship. We kind of knew this going into it, that as male academics, it was a limitation, but there was too much good material on the cutting room floor to just kind of leave it there. So I'm glad that we did it. And then also recognizing that this is the academic process, is that we hope people cite the paper. We hope people critique the paper. We hope people find it useful as a platform to build on in their own research that they you know, see value in it. And so this for us isn't the, the end of the conversation, it's just the beginning. And so uh, that for, is really the most important piece to stress here is sort of, um, we don't see it as the definitive uh, narrative on female gang membership but we hope it sparks interest and that people see some value in, in, the, in the argument that they can then uh, build upon it with their, own, with their own research. Definitely, I would agree with that, yeah. It's been great working with you and with Robert and Simon in this project, as always. Oh, it's, it's such a privilege. And, and, you know, it's one of those things like when you're working with your friends, it's kind of like it doesn't feel like work. Um, <laughs> And uh, so it, it's, it's been a great, great pleasure. I'm really grateful for the opportunities, definitely. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for joining me today, James. If you're interested in reading the full paper, um, then it's titled Deficit or Credit, a Comparative Qualitative Study of Gender Agency and Female Gang Membership in Los Angeles and Glasgow. It's published in the journal Crime and Delinquency, um, so volume 66, number 8, uh, just published this month. And um, if you, you know, have any trouble locating the paper, then please just get in contact with myself or James directly and we can send you a copy. And the authorship is myself, uh, uh, James Densley, Simon Harding and Robert McLean.